Things Earthlings. This is part two of my series on personal development and mental health, where I share my journey towards healing from a culture of trauma. In this part, I will share some Western approaches that have worked for me, which I learned through therapy and now practice regularly. Although I no longer see mental health providers, I may go back in the future. I have my critiques of Western medicine and mental health providers, and if you're curious about that, go check out part one of my series. But for now, let's cover some Western-based approaches that have actually worked for me, and I hope this information is helpful. Enjoy the rest of the video. So the first perspective that we're going to talk about is Stoic philosophy, or Stoicism. Stoicism has origins in ancient Greece. Fundamentally, the idea of Stoicism is to lead a good life by not succumbing to overwhelming emotions, by using rational thinking and logic to solve your problems. Worrying about the future is going to create a lot of anxiety. So the Stoic approach would be to think about rationally, like, is there anything to worry about? And if there's any like legitimate reasons, like how intense is the risk? How is the threat? Risk assessment. Is it actually that bad? It's worth mentioning that the Stoics believed we suffer more in our imagination than we do in reality. To the Stoics, the misery of the future happens in the present. The Stoics believed that when life hurts, it often means that we care about things we have no control over, and by doing so, we let them control us. To them, future only exists in our thoughts. And caring too much about the future creates fear and anxiety. This is best represented by a quote by Marcus Aurelius. Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it, if you have to, with the same weapons of reason which today arm you against the present. Thinking rationally and being analytical is crucial to a Stoic philosophy and living a Stoic life. Also, for those of you who are fans of therapy, I recently discovered that Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, has origins in Stoicism, which is all about, you know, rationally thinking about your emotions and getting down to the root beliefs that you hold about a situation or yourself and, you know, really like teasing it out, breaking it out in a very like analytical way. And so I see this ancient philosophy being very applicable in modern times and through therapy. Again, I'm trying to focus on things that we can do that don't rely on a therapist, but for most of the things that I'm talking about, especially the practices that we're going to go into, it might be helpful to start with a therapist to guide you through the things, and then you can develop the skills to do it on your own. And that's kind of an approach that I've taken with a lot of the practices that I'm going to share today. However, I have a lot of concerns with that. Stoicism is often associated with toxic emotional repression. And it's also associated with a lot of the problems we have in our society. And it's really popular amongst patriarchal thinkers to not want to express emotions, dismissing women as being too emotional and irrational, or, you know, repressing your feelings and never talking about them and just, you know, trudging forward, enduring, being really strong and not succumbing to foolish emotions. So this broicism is a misunderstanding of stoicism, but it does have really bad consequences for our societies when we're not dealing with our emotions. That's one of my primary concerns with stoicism. It's not really one of the modalities that I like to embody, but I think there's a lot that we can take from stoicism that is useful. The channel Philosophy Tube is run by a transgender woman and she does a really excellent video called Ancient Therapy for Modern Problems, Stoic Philosophy Explained. And I think she does a really good job of going into the history, the origins of Stoicism, the applications of it, and some of the criticisms and concerns for, you know, a society that relies too much on Stoicism. And it was a really good and funny entertaining video, so you should definitely watch that. Okay, next we have kind of moving in the opposite direction of Stoicism, a practice called somatic experiencing or somatic healing. 
And I have a little pamphlet here that I found that I can just read off of, so that's great. So what is somatic experiencing? Uh, trauma resolution. Somatic experiencing, or SE, is psychobiological trauma resolution. It is a potent method for resolving trauma symptoms and relieving chronic stress. It is the life's work of Dr. Peter A. Levine, resulting from his multidisciplinary study of stress physiology, psychology, ethology, biology, neuroscience, indigenous healing practices, and medical biophysics, together with over 45 years of successful clinical application, which is key to transforming PTSD and the wounds of emotional and early developmental attachment trauma. I'm not going to get into attachment trauma in this video too much, but I will say that I definitely have had experiences with, you know, uh, insecure attachment. Somatic experiencing is moves in the opposite direction of stoicism, which is all about, like, not succumbing to emotions, not giving to the emotions. Somatic experiencing, you're actually moving towards the emotions and you're sitting in them. For example, anger. Anger gets repressed a lot in our culture because it's such a strong emotion, but it's also incredibly wise. Anger is informing you of, of something. Usually your boundaries being violated or you feeling very uncomfortable or not feeling heard or something. It's like, it's, there's an underlying grief under there as well. And so being able to sit with anger, feel it, right? Let yourself get flushed and uh, like yell if you have to, and then allowing it to like pass and identifying what is the underlying like problem. That's a huge part of somatic experiencing. And again, you might wanna try somatic experiencing with somebody who's an experienced guide or somatic healer. Um, in your community, this can be therapists, this can be social workers, because it can be really intense, like getting into an emotion, a difficult thing, and then transforming out of that so that you can actually experience healing. We're not just coping, we're actually transforming our emotional pain and suffering through somatic healing. So you might need a guide to help you a, a few times, but I think it's possible to do it on your own if you feel comfortable doing that. And I've definitely explored a little bit of that on my own, but. Um, it's one of those things where because emotions are so intense, you might want to have like somebody guiding you through the stages. Finally, the last thing that I want to talk about under the Western approach is internal family systems or IFS, also known as parts work. IFS was created by Dr. Richard C. Schwartz. As far as Western psychology goes, I think it's one of the best things to come out of the Western model of thinking, which is very much systems thinking. Western approach is very systematic. It's categorizing, it's analytical, it's identifying, labeling. That's how Westerners do things typically. While I don't really like that approach, I think that IFS takes the best parts of Western medicine and also incorporates a little bit of like Eastern and even indigenous holistic thinking approaches and kind of blends them together. And so I, I, it was definitely something that I wanted to talk about. So I have this book written by Dick Schwartz and it's called No Bad Parts. I highly recommend this book for reading about the approach, the theory behind it, and some practices that can be used in therapy and also on your own. Again, enlisting the help of a therapist to do a lot of these practices to guide you through them is highly recommended, but you can do it on your own. I think I use parts work in IFS almost every single day. Out of everything that's come out of Western psychology, I think IFS is one of the most groundbreaking and transformational approaches to doing healing work. And so the idea behind using IFS or parts work is that every single person is fragmented into many different parts. We all have these fragmented parts inside of us and they, they do different roles and they serve different functions to help us survive, especially if we've experienced abuse, neglect, um, little t or big t trauma, all of those things. Parts work, I think, understands that we are multifaceted, we're very nuanced, our internal worlds have an incredible amount of variety to them. And so they have categorized, because Western medicine loves to categorize and label things, they've categorized uh, the different parts inside of people that generally appear for most people in the population. And those are your managers, 
your wounded parts. The wounded parts can also sometimes be called exiles. I think that's what they refer to them in the book. Your protectors and the authentic, capital S, authentic self. And that one is very important. So the authentic self is present in every single person. And it's something that you can tap into at any point. The authentic self is capable of infinite amount of compassion, patience, generosity, kindness. It is found in every single human being. And it's interesting because this is also something that they talk about in Eastern philosophies as well. And I, I love that Western science has finally gotten to a point where they're like acknowledging what Buddhists have been saying for thousands of years. Um, but it's there's a lot of truth to it. So in IFS, the authentic self is like a source of healing for everyone. And you need help because our culture rewards people to abandon themselves. It rewards inauthenticity. And so being able to tap into your authentic self to heal is critical. The other parts that IFS talks about, the managers, the wounded parts, and the protectors, there's a bunch of other parts too, but I'm gonna keep it this one simple. I could honestly do a whole other video just on IFS. The managers are often like your ego. It's the part of you that runs the show. It's the part of you that's narrating your head a lot of the time. It's the part of you that is always in control and trying to keep everything under control. Those are your managers and they do serve a very important function but they are not always helpful. Next we have the wounded parts. And the wounded parts are very special. Those are the parts of everybody who has experienced trauma, which is everybody. Trauma is a fact of life, that it does not have to be a life sentence. The wounded parts within people are oftentimes children, or maybe they're young adults, right? Or like or recent parts of you that experienced something very recently. Because our dominant culture doesn't encourage people to be vulnerable, and it also doesn't provide the necessary like skills to most people to be able to help each other, um, especially like your family is often a source of trauma. If your family was not equipped with good relational skills and good communication skills, you probably have a lot of trauma. You probably have experienced neglect and abuse and emotional trauma of some kind. So we all have wounded parts and they need help. They also can be transformed. So your wounded parts can change and they can transform into a healed part that serves a really important role. Those exiled parts of you are very important and listening to those wounded parts can be very transformative um, because they do carry a lot of wisdom about the trauma that you've experienced. The most common approach that I've used to doing parts work and healing wounded parts involves interacting with the other part that I mentioned, protectors. And protectors are parts of you that were created in response to a traumatic experience. The protector parts will come up and they try to help you survive because maybe you didn't have uh, people looking out for you or maybe you didn't have you know, a very loving family that had good relational skills. So you develop these protector parts to protect yourself and it's very important. But those protector parts also have another role and they could be doing that role which is usually something a lot more beneficial for you and for society as a whole but because of the wounds that you've received from society and the culture around you your protectors are so busy trying to protect that wounded part from feeling from being seen or from getting hurt again that it completely derails them from like doing the thing that they're good at and then they do the thing that they're good at in in a place where it's just sometimes like really inappropriate for example somebody who was wounded as a child by being bullied and ridiculed for expressing something that was totally natural but but the culture did not support you or the environment you were in was unwelcoming of that so then you develop a protector part right and this protector part doesn't want that part that's wounded to be hurt again so you don't show any desire or interest in things that would have interested you when you were a kid because you don't want that part to get hurt again there are so many ways that protector parts can manifest these weird behaviors that really limit you from being authentic and from being yourself. But they're trying to help. It, that's the saddest part is like those protector parts are trying to protect you, but they don't always know the best way to do that. 
And so what you'll end up with is a wounded part that never gets healed, a protector part that is never really letting you access the wounded part. The protector parts can have this judgmental sort of energy to them about the wounded part. It's like, like, God, you're, you're so annoying. You need to stop crying. Get your shit together. Man up. Grow up. That sort of judgment, right? This is what the protector parts will often do because that part of you is frustrated that it has to do this thing instead of doing the thing that it actually wants to do, right? Like maybe that protector part is really good at public speaking or maybe it's really good having debates or like, you know, being a fighter or like really being impassioned and doing something that it really loves. Like that's a part of you that could be spending energy in that, in a thing that you really love, but instead you are spending that energy trying to suppress that wounded part. To wrap it all up, the healing process through IFS that I've seen really works for me is listening to the emotions, right? When you have an emotion, leaning into it and questioning it, asking it a couple of questions like, how old are you? What is it that you're feeling? What is it that you want to be doing instead of what you're doing right now? And what do you need to happen for you to stop doing the thing that you're doing. And these questions can help shed a lot of light into every single part that you're working with, whether it's a manager, a protector, or a wounded part. And then lastly, thanking the parts of you for sharing their perspective, for being vulnerable and honest with you. That can help ease a lot of the judgment and criticism that we innately body. Okay, that was a lot, but I think that covers it. If you want to read more about IFS and internal family systems or parts work, definitely check out this book, No Bad Parts by Dick Schwartz. There's also guided parts work videos that you can watch on YouTube to see it in action. And there's a lot of talks and stuff that Dick Schwartz has uh, shared on how he developed his perspective and how he developed this methodology for healing through internal family systems. So I hope that it's helpful for you. I know it's been super helpful for me to be able to do parts work. I do it every day almost. And um, yeah, you can you, do it with your friends. Do it with your family, you know? <laughs> Just kidding. Don't. Hello, Earthlings. I forgot to add one more practice to my video. One of my favorite things to do is to write out my thoughts into a journal. And this helps me relieve a lot of the stress that I can get from rumination or overthinking or just having emotions trapped in my thoughts and my body. And just getting them out onto a piece of paper can be enough to relieve the stress or to get it out of me, right? To express it in a way. And I find this ritual very rejuvenating. And it's important to uh, also ask or answer questions in my journaling, like, you know, what am I upset about? What am I regretting? What am I resentful about? And especially those negative emotions that can really bog you down. And then once I'm done writing, very important part is I rip it out and I throw it away. And if I wanna be really, I don't know, dramatic about it or <laughs> make it into a ritual, I might burn it even. This practice helps a lot with releasing those negative emotions, so feel free to steal it. If this video was helpful in any way or informative, drop it a like. I hear that helps with the algorithm and it helps me get this content out to more people. Don't forget to subscribe too for more content. And thanks for watching and see you on the next video.